This is the pre-lab slide presentation for experiment number eight, the synthesis of triphenylmethanol. We're going to be synthesizing triphenylmethanol starting with bromobenzene, reacting it with benzophenone using a Grignard reagent to form triphenylmethanol. As always, we're going to first do some planning and preparation. We're going to collect and organize all our glassware and chemicals, which you'll see in the experimental video. We also need to read some end of the book sections in about lab techniques. Excluding water from chemical reactions is an important organic technique because many organic chemical reactions are sensitive to water. We also need to trap some gases and we're going to be doing some trituration, which is washing and drying of solids in OP26A. This is a list of all the chemicals we're going to be using in this experiment and there's a bunch of them. So we're going to be working in the hood as always. We're going to be wearing our goggles and wearing our gloves. So the first thing we do, we need to dry all our glassware. If we have a chemical reaction that's water sensitive, water can absorb onto the surface of glassware. So we're going to bake it at 110 degrees for 30 minutes. Some things we can't bake at that high temperatures like the lids and the O-rings and the seals that are in our system. So we're going to put those at a low temperature vacuum oven and actually pump on them for several hours, in this case overnight. We also need to make sure that during the chemical reaction that we don't get moisture coming in from the atmosphere. So we're going to set up our system with these drying tubes and we're going to fill those with calcium sulfate, which is a desiccant, meaning it absorbs moisture that passes by it. So this is the setup that we have here. We have a round bottom flask. We have our Claisen adapter, which just separates it into two different sections so that we can add two different things to the top. On one side, we're going to have an addition funnel. And this is where we're going to be adding all our chemical reagents through this addition funnel. So there's a valve down here which we can open up which will drip reagents down into a round bottom flask. On top of that, we have a drying tube. Again, we can't seal a system up when we're heating because it would build up pressure. So we have to have some place for the gases to escape. But we also want to make sure that water can't come back in. So we fill this again with dry right, the desiccant. And that prevents moisture from getting back down into our reaction vessel. On the second side, we're going to add a condensing tube. So this is going to be a water jacketed condenser. And so water comes in the bottom, cools down the inner tube, and then leaves through the top outlet. As any vapors come up, they see the cold water and they condense back down into the round bottom flask. We're also going to put a drying tube on this side. Again, we don't want to seal it, but we want to prevent any moisture coming back into the system. So dry right is just calcium sulfate sold under the name of dry right. It's anhydrous. It usually comes in a colored form. That's because if it's blue, that tends to mean that it has not absorbed water yet and will absorb water. Once it turns pink, that means it has absorbed water and it's time to change it over. Sometimes you see a combination of both blue and pink in systems. So once we get that all set up, we're going to weigh out our magnesium to prepare a Grignard reagent. We're going to weigh out approximately 10 millimoles and then we're going to scrape it to remove any oxide from the surface and then we're going to dry it also. So we're going to put it and the round bottom flask back in the 110 degree C oven and bake it for 5 to 10 minutes to remove any moisture from its surface. Now that we've got our glassware all set up, it's time to start the actual chemical reaction. We have the magnesium now in our round bottom flask. We now just need to add our bromobenzene. We're going to do that first by diluting it a little bit. So we're going to take 10 millimoles of dry bromobenzene, put it in a small Erlenmeyer flask. 
To that flask, we'll add 10 milliliters of diethyl ether. We'll then put that mixture into our additional funnel and open the valve and drain it into our round bottom flask. For just a brief moment, we're going to remove that round bottom flask and crush the magnesium with a loop, the stirring bar just to increase the surface area. And we need to do this quickly so that we don't introduce any moisture into the system. Once we've done that, we're going to reassemble our round bottom onto the rest of the glassware. We're going to add 5 milliliters of diethyl ether to the additional funnel up above, and we're going to start it drop dripping into the round bottom flask. Once we've added all that diethyl ether, we then need to warm up our bath to reflux it. Because ether is such a low boiling material, we can literally just use some warm water to start it to reflux. After 15 minutes, we're going to cool that to room temperature and move on to the next step. The next step is to take our green yard reagent and react it with our ketone, in this case benzophenone, to actually form the triphenyl complex with magnesium bromide. We're going to do that by dissolving 10 millimoles of benzophenone, which is a solid, in 5 milliliters of diethyl ether. We're then going to put that into our addition funnel again in our glass apparatus. And we're going to start dripping it into our phenyl magnesium bromide solution. And at that point, note that there are some dramatic color changes that occur. We're then going to heat that for 15 more minutes, in other words, reflux it, in order to allow energy to inter be introduced into the system and the reaction to be complete. And then we're going to cool it down. At that point, we still have this magnesium bromide complex here, so we need to work it up. And we typically, in chemical reactions, have something called a reaction workup, where in this case, we're going to add 2.5 milliliters of water drop by drop into the additional funnel. And then we're going to add 5 milliliters of HCl drop by drop through the addition funnel. And that's to accomplish this last step in the chemical reaction, where we remove the magnesium bromine from our molecule and create the alcohol. We might need to add some more diethyl ether to dissolve any solid if present. If not, we're going to move on to the next step. Once we've done the workup, we then need to re remove any other materials that might be in our solution. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to do a gravity filtration to remove any unreacted magnesium and the stir bar that is sitting in there. We're going to do that by making some fluted filter paper and pouring our liquid through there, trapping any of the solids. We're then going to take our liquid and transfer it over to a separatory funnel. At that point, we'll find that there are two layers. We have an organic layer, which contains ether and our triphenyl methanol. And we're going to have an aqueous layer, because we've just added a little bit of water and some HCl. So we're going to first drain off the aqueous layer. And then we're going to add to our organic layer, which is still in the separatory funnel, 7.5 milliliters of sodium bicarbonate to wash out any acidic compounds that might be in there. We're going to drain the aqueous layer off. We're then going to add saturated sodium chloride solution to our separatory funnel, wash our organic layer with sodium chloride to remove any ionic compounds, drain off the aqueous layer again. Then we're going to drain our organic layer into a beaker. Some water might have come along with that organic layer, so we're going to dry it with sodium sulfate, and we're going to add just enough until there's no longer any clumping. When we can see some of the sodium sulfate sort of in a light powdery appearance, and then we'll gravity filter that to remove the sodium sulfate and water. At that point, all we're going to have in our beaker is going to be our diethyl ether, our triphenyl methanol, and we might still have any other organic side products that we synthesize. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to remove the diethyl ether, and we're going to do that with a vacuum assist. 
So we're going to set up our small sidearm flask. We're going to put it in an ice bath. We're going to attach that to the vacuum system. We're also then going to put a one hole stopper on top of our sidearm flask and put a tube down into our beaker just to help evaporate some of the diethyl ether off and hopefully then trap it in our ice bath here. Next we're going to do something called trituration. We're going to take our dry solid now which is in a beaker. We're going to add six milliliters of hexane to that beaker and then we're going to start smashing up the solid. What that does is it releases any trapped impurities that might be in the solid that are soluble in hexane. And people have historically found that in a Grignard reagent using bromobenzene, you tend to get a byproduct called biphenyl, which is soluble. So we're just going to try to extract out all that organic biphenyl. And then we're going to collect our solid, our triphenyl methanol, by vacuum filtration. It still might not be pure, so we're going to recrystallize it. We're going to dissolve it in hot 2 to 1 hexanes ethanol mixture, about 10 to 20 milliliters. And then we're going to allow it to slowly crystallize at room temperature. We'll put it in an ice bath. And then we'll collect those crystals by vacuum filtration. We're then going to put it in a 90 degree C oven again to dry it off if you remove any of the ethanol or hexanes that still might be there. And then finally, we're going to do some analysis. We're going to do infrared spectroscopy on our product, but we're also going to do it on our starting materials. So we'll do infrared spectroscopy on our triphenylmethanol, our benzophenone, our bromobenzene, and this time we're going to actually collect and save and analyze a background spectrum, meaning an IR spectrum that is of the air. After that, we're going to go over to the melting point apparatus and perform a melting point on our triphenylmethanol product. And then as normal, we would do calculations, document our results, and formulate conclusions. I have done a lot of that already in the video of the experiment and in my lab notebook. For the report this week, what I'd like everyone to do is calculate the moles used of magnesium, bromobenzene, and benzophenone. Use that information to determine the limiting reagent of this reaction. And then calculate the theoretical yield, calculate the percent yield. This will go very quickly. And then I need you to identify the IR bands in the four infrared spectra and concentrate on those that are greater than 1500 wave numbers. I ex want you to identify those bands in the background, the bromobenzene spectrum, benzophenone, and the triphenylmethanol. Note that some of these will be groups because they're very complex. Just identify the groups. Then by watching the videos, I want you to determine the melting point range for the synthesized triphenylmethanol. So you should report a range, which means the temperature at which it starts to melt, the solidest temperature, all the way up till all the material is melted, which is the liquidest temperature. And then I want you to calculate the percent air at three points in the melting point range. The solidest, where it starts to melt, the liquidus, where it's completely melted, and then pick the midpoint in that range and calculate that percent error also. You're going to be using the same value for the accepted one. You're just going to be calculating three different percent errors.